This is Twit. Let's get the headlines. And our first headline is not a happy one. This is Space News and and just about every other press outlet in the country in the last couple of days. And so we're talking about the JPL layoffs. Now, I just want to predicate this by saying, you know, I've I've worked in and out of the lab and around the lab for decades because I live close to it. So, of course, we follow the news because it's a local NASA field center. And we've had rounds of layoffs probably on average about every eight to 10 years for decades, sometimes savage. Uh, But for some reason, this time, which is in the eight to 10% uh, range of the staff and contractors, made international headlines. Yeah, yeah. Which was kind of interesting. Uh, So tell us what you know. So, so just to just to kind of put the 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 facts out there, uh, basically this week, uh, NASA uh, uh, leadership at JPL, as well as as uh, at headquarters, because the uh, the NASA administrator Bill Nelson had a whole uh, statement on on this, but they announced that they were they were laying off about five hundred and thirty. Uh, employees, that's 8% and 40 contractors. So that's about 8% of the workforce there at, um, at, uh, at, at the jet propulsion laboratory with, um, uh, and, and they're saying that it's, it's part of the efforts because of just some budget stuff that they're facing. Um, they say specifically that it's because of the lack of an actual official fiscal year 2024 budget that Congress keeps passing these continuing resolutions, which uh, is affecting their ability to plan what they need to spend, plus cuts to the Mars sample return mission, which is a huge project, of course, at at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They land things on Mars. That's like what they're known for, you know, Mm -hmm. and this project that has been under increasing scrutiny because of its uh, its its budget, uh, uh, you know, in in uh, in Washington and 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 its hurdles as well. There was like a recent report about just how challenging it was and that it was going to be more difficult and more uh, expensive than than uh, than than previously thought um, has been um, kind of like a key a key driver. And so the, the folks at space news, and I believe this was Jeff Faust. Uh, yes, it was him. The, 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 the man with the plan over at space news, you know, he flagged that, that, that these layoffs were in response to NASA's decision back in November to cut budget spending on the Mars sample return mission, uh, because they're operating on this continuum resolution at 2023 levels, not at 2024 levels or anything, mm. um, that, that doesn't include for the extra spending they need to, to really develop, the, the sample return uh, mission, which is like a, um, uh, uh, you know, there, there's, there's big differences there. Like in the, in the, uh, the house, they have like a, a billion dollar uh, funding mission for, uh, for this 949 million, but then there's only 300 million of funding for that mission in, um, in the Senate. And they don't know, NASA doesn't know what they can plan for. So they have to like make their spending uh, decisions now for what they might end up getting. It's just really hard to see. Because, and I think that to your point, and I'll try to keep it short, but to your point about why this cut, these cuts are getting the, the attention now right. is because of the highs that we're coming off of. You know, just last week, uh, NASA said goodbye to the Ingenuity helicopter, uh, a, a JPL project that was designed for one month, lasted three years, designed for five flights, flew more than 70. Uh, they've got these two nuclear powered rovers exploring Mars, uh, doing gangbuster work, and they are known for daring mighty things. So th- in the last few a uh, few months, uh, they have come off of all of these highs, uh, of all of these amazing things that they've been doing, and they're not low profile. I mean, the the helicopter itself was international news, and then you get hit a week later with these uh, substantial uh, uh, workforce uh, layoffs uh, from the people that brought you all of that, and that's kind of, I think, the sticker shock from the public side. It's like we have these people that can do these amazing things, build things that last you know, years, decades, even on other planets. And now we're, we're going to cut funding there because of what's going on in Washington right now, which doesn't make a lot of sense because if you want to do the big things, you kind of have to pay for them, you know? And uh, it's, it's why we've seen a lot of challenges with other parts of the space program too. Well, I think you bring up a good point about the the value for money spent at JPL. So uh, there's been a lot of talk about, oh, this is because of Mars sample return. That budget's ballooned to $10 billion, which is in uh, James Webb's space telescope range. Yeah. So it's a lot. And we've been studying Mars sample return since the late 60s. Soviets looked hard at it. We looked hard at it. 
in both cases, it was always going to be expensive. In the old days, they were talking about, I think, two or three Saturn V launches to make it work. <clears throat> so it was a big, heavy program. It was going to cost a lot of money. Uh, let's just bear in mind, I, I, I suggest that, as, as you pointed out uh, many times over on this show, J, you know, the value return that JPL gives us. Yeah. You get a rover like Opportunity that's supposed to last three months. And it lasted 14 freaking years. I know. So, you know, what would happen on the Mars sample return? I mean, you're still going to have rovers left on the planet, uh, a fetch rover, I believe. And maybe a maybe even two helicopters. We don't yeah. know. You know? After, so. after all is said and done. So it's just, you know, and just for perspective, not that I'm pointing any particular fingers here, but oh, yes, I am. Uh, the Mars sample return budget is about one one hundred and thirteenth of what the F thirty five will cost within a couple of years. <laughs> Not that we don't need fighter planes, <sighs> but good lord, people, can you just shut the tap off and stop paying for it? All right, I'll shut up now. Space dot com brings us Axiom three astronauts splashdown. That's right. This is like hot off the presses because this happened this morning. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the latest private mission to the International Space Station is in the books. That's Axiom Space's uh, AX-3 uh, mission, which launched four astronauts to the space station on January 18th. Uh, it came back to Earth today. That is about uh, uh, 21 days of in-orbit time, um, and that is the longest, uh, the longest private mission to the space station for Axiom Space. Uh, so that's a new record. Um, this mission was really interesting for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, it was uh, the first all-European Axiom Space kind of private mission uh, to fly on a SpaceX rocket, launched on the SpaceX uh, Crew Dragon uh, Freedom, and it included uh, uh, like their chief astronaut at Axiom Space, that's Michael Lopez uh, Alegria. If that name sounds familiar, it's because he's a former uh, NASA astronaut who also commanded the International Space Station. And, uh, and this is his second flight, so he's the first uh, two-time flyer on uh, Axiom Space. He's the, the He uh, commanded the first mission to AX-1. Peggy Whitson commanded AX-2 last year. And uh, and then it had uh, another familiar name in private space flight, Walter v Viaday, uh, I think is how you pronounce it. He is an Italian Air Force colonel. And it, the reason it sounds familiar is because he also launched on, on a Virgin Galactic uh, a, a mission, uh, their first kind of commercial flight uh, last year. So he's he's mm -hmm. got some orbital time in him. He was the pilot for the mission. Uh, then you have Turkey's first al uh, astronaut, Alper um, uh, Jezuravach. Jezuravach. <laughs> Easy for Je you to say. <laughs> I'm I'm very embarrassed now, but uh, Jezuravachi, um and he was the he's, he's Turkey's first astronaut. And he had a whole science mission in campaign. He actually spoke to the president while he was up there. Um, and then rounding up the crew, and this is an interesting one, and this is uh, Sweden's uh, Marcus Want, a European Space Agency reserve astronaut. And so he's the first of the reserve astronaut corps to fly him. And that's a program that ESA put together where they sign people on for countries that don't like maybe have the, the funding to, to train an, uh, an astronaut full time, uh, but they'll have them in reserve. And then if a flight, uh, if the country buys a flight, then they'll train the astronaut to fly. So interesting, interesting path to space for him. He took some amazing photos, by the way, Marcus Watt of the earth from space, uh, including on his last night in orbit, um, uh, like sunsets and like nighttime earth just absolutely gorgeous uh, that people should go back and check out. But you know, the 56 different experiments over, over the last uh, three weeks. And um, uh, so it wasn't just space tourism uh, for tourism's sake. And finally uh, <laughs> they got like an extra four or five days out of it because their, de their landing was uh, delayed by, um, uh, uh, by weather on earth. They landed uh, about, uh, just off the shore of Daytona Beach, uh, Florida, and uh, and so they had to wait for for clear weather, and that was weather that had been delaying like NASA's launch of the Pace mission to uh, the last week too. So it was uh, it was uh, uh, a lot of uh, impeding a lot of traffic going up and coming down. And finally, from Space dot com, we have what sounds like the next Tom Hanks mystery mega movie, <laughs> Renaissance era astronomy text hide secret message. That's right. That's right. So this this one came from Elizabeth Howell over at space.com. She found this story and it's absolutely uh, awesome. Basically, the Rochester Institute of Technology, which is in Buffalo, uh, New York, uh, received a couple of Renaissance era 
books as like gifts. They were from like a collector, someone that, that had, had them. And one of them actually is by Copernicus. And, and uh, uh, but the, the other is this 15th century book by a 13th century scientist uh, and monk called Johannes de, and here's another name, Sacrobosco. I think I've pronounced that correctly. Um, and it's, it's Johannes's book that has the these 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 scientists or these researchers at the university uh peaked uh, because they think it's what's called a palimpsest right do, do you know what a palimpsest is rod because i had to look this word up today uh, so. not until you suggest it no yeah so it is it is it is a book where the, you know, the material that they used to, to make these books was really precious and if they don't want a book but they want to write another one they would wash it off and then write a new book on top of it. And apparently they think that's what happened with really? this book that they have. On so, the parchment. They'd yeah, the so, parchment. Oh. so that the parchment has this previous book underneath it, uh, what is there now. And the interesting thing about these two books together is that Johannes's book, uh, which is in Latin and it's called De Sphera Mundi, On the Sphere of the World, puts the earth at the center of the whole universe, right? And, and, uh, uh, and, and then they have this book with the book, the 16th century book by Nicholas uh, Copernicus, which is that Earth is not the center, that the sun is the center. So you've got these kind of juxtaposing views of, of Earth's role in the cosmos. And so they're going to start using instruments to look at Johannes's book uh, where they can kind of look past the surface text and see the remains of the original text behind it. And we're going to see like what's in there uh, in the near future. Um, and it's just kind of a, a neat uh, uh, kind of mystery story uh, for, for ancient astronomy that I think you, as you mentioned, would make Dan proud, uh, Dan Brown proud. <laughs> so, And, and we'll finally prove that the earth is in fact flat because we've been <laughs> working on that for a long time. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there.